to wait a few moments to let everybody um, get on to the webinar and then we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. My name's Peter Arndt. I'm the Executive Officer of the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission in the Archdiocese of Brisbane, which covers South East Queensland. And we're very pleased to be co-hosting this webinar on protecting the platypus with Wildlife Queensland. Welcome to everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the country, uh, or wherever each of you as participants are viewing this webinar today. We pay our respects to the elders of the many generations past and the present and those emerging who have had a continuing and intimate relationship with the country. Uh, we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, just over a month ago, after a bit of outdoor adventure with a couple of friends, I was walking back to our car um, along a creek near Canungra and one of our friends spotted a platypus frolicking in the water in the middle of the day. We were utterly enchanted by this vision of a platypus playing around in the water and we stood there for quite some time. We were just delighted uh, to see up close and personal this member of an iconic Australian species. You could imagine the surprise I had when talking to our friends in Wildlife Queensland to find out that platypus numbers had declined a lot since Europeans arrived in Australia. Uh, and we wanted to learn more about it and offer heaps of people the opportunity to learn more about what's happening to the platypus. And just as importantly, to find out how we can help to protect the platypus. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the project manager for Wildlife Queensland, Matt Cecil. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, Peter. Thank you so much for that introduction. That's very kind. My name is Matt Cecil. Um, I'm a project manager for the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland, which is a not-for-profit, non-government wildlife conservation organisation. And we're driven to advocate for, protect and conserve Queensland's wildlife and their habitat. I'd like to firstly thank the Catholic Archdiocese of Brisbane for the opportunity uh, to participate in their Season of Creation webinar series. It's a great platform for us to be able to present um, to the general public on the work that we've been doing with platypus, which is an important species. Um, we are talking today about Australia's elusive platypus, and I guess never was there a more mixed up looking animal found on Australian continent, at least I think, but uh, you know, we are the, the land of unusual wildlife. You just have to think about a kangaroo, a, a, you know, a large marsupial mammal that hops around with a big long tail and carries a joe in their pouch. So, you know, maybe the platypus uh, fits right in to Australia's landscape. Um, but there's more to it. The platypus is a very important flag bearer uh, for the conservation of freshwater aquatic systems. Um, 
the species requires healthy and connected waterways to survive, but they're much better looking and far cuter than say a dragonfly larva, a caddisfly larva, or a freshwater mussel. So when selling a conservation message, it's, it's a much easier uh, process using the platypus than it is a little wiggly worm. However, the conservation of the platypus benefits every other living species that uses the aquatic waterway that they share. Um, so it's a really important um, bearer of conservation news. Wildlife Queensland is extremely proud of our association with platypus conservation and we've been working to help this species since at least 2003 through our platypus watch network. And much of that work uh, revolves around community observation programs helping to educate the community and asking that they participate in the conservation of this particularly interesting species. We've also driven some uh, campaigns to help eliminate the risk faced, to, faced by platypus with inappropriate and illegal fishing equipment and nets. And our guest presenter will bring a little more information on that later on in this, this talk. Luckily for you though, the entire webinar, including the information slides and, the rec and a recorded version of this will be available on the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland website, which is www.wildlife.org.au. So if you have to leave for any particular time this morning, that's okay, no problems. Uh, you'll be able to download the content and watch it in full at a later date and pass it on to your friends and family. If they show an interest in platypus conservation, then there's a good way they can, can follow along. If you have any questions for myself or our presenter throughout this webinar, please ask them using the question feature at the bottom of the page down there. Uh, and we'll get to answering those at the very end of the webinar um, in the Q and A session. So let's get stuck in. I want to introduce you to Tamil Brunt, our platypus guru. Hold on one second while I do one of these. I'm going to share a screen. Bear with me. Maybe, maybe not. That's okay. Uh, Tamil, I don't know if you can hear me, but say hello if you can, Tamil. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Technology, huh? Um, Tamil is a Wildlife Queensland Platypus Project Officer and a PhD candidate with the University of Queensland. Tamil is conducting really important research into the health and population status of Southeast Queensland's platypus populations. And, and oddly enough, um, up until Tamil started her work, there was really very little information on the Southeast Queensland platypus population. Was, was it growing, was it contracting, was it healthy or was it sick? Um, so this, so Tamil's PhD is terribly important to learn just basic information about the platypus. But Tamil has also been volunteering her time with Wildlife Queensland since early 2014, um, which is, is fantastic for myself and our organisation because Tamil is one of the most hardworking and dedicated driven people you'll ever come across. And I can guarantee you the platypus have never been better off you now they've got Tamil in their corner. So um, over to you, Tamil. Thanks for that great introduction, Matt. <laughs> Keep it coming. All righty, let's get into this. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I really appreciate uh, people far and wide to be joining us. It's been absolutely wonderful. And I love talking about the platypus, so even better. I just also want to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land that we meet today, but more so specifically, one of the local names for platypus is called Wajan. And the guardian of Scrubby Creek, which is just south of Brisbane, Wajan is uh, the protector of that creek, which is a, a beautiful story. Um, I uh, encourage you to go and Google the story of Wajan later on today if you have some time. It's really lovely. But also the dream time for our First Nations people about the platypus was uh, about a duck and a rakali, which is our native water rat, and how they fell in love and they uh, had babies called the platypus or wajan. So it's a really beautiful story as well. But for certainly the first settlers, the platypus specimen that first arrived in England back in 1798 was absolutely baffling. And they thought it was a hoax. What is this duck-billed, beaver-tailed and otter-footed looking critter. 
And they were right to be suspicious because back in those days, there were what they called a Asiatic fantasy makers where they would stitch together different pieces of animal body parts. So something like a mermaid was a fish tail and a monkey body. But they didn't find any stitching in the platypus, did they? So the hoax, <coughs> excuse me. So it continued to baffle them for another 85 years before they even confirmed that platypus laid eggs. And where were they actually going to put that within the taxonomy of things? So they are a mammal and they are in their own uh, group of, called monotremes because they lay eggs and they also suckle their young with milk. And it's only two of the surviving monotremes in the world, which is the echidna. Uh, there's the short-beaked echidna here in Australia and uh, the long-beaked echidna, which is in Papua New Guinea. But the platypus is solely uh, Australian. It's an iconic Australian, like a lot of our wildlife. And its population runs from the cold Tasmania through to as far as Cooktown in the, sub, in the tropics of Queensland. Unfortunately, it is now extinct on the mainland of South Australia, but there was a reintroduced population on uh, Kangaroo Island, which as far as I was aware was going quite gangbusters, but we're not too sure about how the fires have impacted that. Um, hopefully there will be some more research coming out about uh, that population soon. Platypus is one of only two semi-aquatic mammals, uh, the other one being the Rakali, our native water rat, very distinct with a white tipped tail. And adult male platypuses can get up to 2.6 kilos or average about 1.5 here in Queensland. I seem to be catching um, about that size for a, a male. Females are certainly smaller as well, averaging around the one kilo mark. The smallest little female I've caught was about 700 grams. Uh, she must have been a, a fresh juvenile just out of the nest at that time. That was last year's season. And they certainly range in their length as well. Um, males being longer at uh, averaging about 50 centimetres and the females being about uh, 40 or so centimetres. There is also a size differentiation between the north and south due to climate. So very similar to our koalas here in Queensland, which are a lot smaller. Our platypus are smaller compared to the very chunky uh, southerners. Uh, they are quite big, and certainly in Tasmania where it is freezing cold. The average lifespan of the platypus in the wild has been over 20 years of age. And it's been amazing that a couple of years ago, the annual platypus surveys uh, run by CESA Australia, the local group, caught, re caught a, cap, a, a platypus at Sunbury. And this platypus was caught back in 1995. He was originally tagged with a uh, metal tag around his foot. And then sometime during that period, he was uh, re tagged with a microchip. And then only caught a couple of years ago. Um, and so he's been in that system for over 20 years, which is absolutely amazing to see. In captivity, they are also up around the 20 years um, of age. I think one of the oldest is about 23, um, possibly at Hillsville Sanctuary down in Victoria. They are an amazing animal. Their fur is so deep, uh, dense and thick, uh, but quite soft. It's approximately six to 900 uh, hairs per square millimetre. That's equivalent to a three millimetre neoprene wetsuit. So it's keeping them very dry to the skin, especially in that cold alpine region of Tasmania. And when they are swimming, they keep nice and, and dry uh, to the skin. So it's certainly um, a, a beautiful uh, addition to them. The males are famous for having a venomous spur, which is on their hind foot. And we can also age class them because of the sheath around uh, this spur. So the top photo, you see that it's really quite thick and has a calcius kind of sheath. That's uh, from a juvenile male. Whereas as they age and it wears down, it gets quite uh, very much pointed and uh, vicious looking really. 
And so this is connected to a venom producing gland just in the thigh, which uh, becomes more active during breeding season. It's not lethal to humans, but apparently the pain is very excruciating and no amount of morphine will actually help you for over 72 hours. So if you ever to come across a platypus, please capture it by the tail. Um, regardless, if you don't know if it's a male or female, if you're rescuing it for whatever reason, please grab it by the tail. You definitely don't want to be tickled by a spur. The mating season is uh, within winter uh, through to spring. Here in Queensland, it starts a bit earlier in July. And in the southern states, it starts about August through to October. The gestation period is about 23 days. And then the female will uh, lay eggs, about one or two, one to three eggs, uh, directly on her abdomen and curl around them. The eggs are tiny at 15 millimetres long and they're similar to uh, reptile or like your snake eggs. They have a very soft parchment like shell. And she'll incubate those eggs for approximately 10 days. Um, and this is just some footage of the mating dance that uh, the platypuses will go through. Uh, during this breeding season. So the male will follow the female around, uh, pull at her tail, uh, she kind of twirls around, um, and they can do this for up to half an hour or even longer. And then the, the male will come up under the female um, to, to mate with her. So they just spin around. It's quite an, an amazing dance. And if you're lucky enough to see this in the wild, it is certainly uh, captivating to see. So the little plat platypuses are born blind and hairless, and again, quite small at 15 millimetres. And mum will uh, suckle them by secreting milk from patches along her belly. So she she doesn't have nipples like normal mammals. Um, it will just exude out pores on her abdomen and the juveniles will just lap it up. And they're growing really fast within the four months that they're in the nest and they will enter the water after that time at about 80 to 90% fully grown. Mum just won't come back to the nest. Um, she'll just leave them to do their own thing and find their own way in the world. So platypus are highly dependent on freshwater uh, rivers, lakes, creeks, and you can even find them in your dam. They can tolerate a wide range of environments. Obviously, we see them in urban Brisbane, urban Melbourne, even close to Sydney. We have them, as I said, from Tasmania uh, through to the wet tropics in near Cooktown. But we're seeing them in areas of her highly urban um, streams where there's housing estates, highways, industrial areas. But ideally for platypus, freshwater, native vegetation to consolidate those banks for their burrow sites. Um, the high stable banks for certainly keeping their burrows above any flood line. Uh, deep pools and shaded area for protection of foraging and mating. A coarse substrate and certainly the logs and debris within the water is really important. This is where their food source is, uh, where their habitat is, and so that's where they forage around. They are nocturnal. I don't think the platypus actually read the textbooks because they can be seen even throughout the day, full sun, open, uh, doing their thing, especially in breeding season when uh, they are a lot more active and Yungala National Park is one of our most uh, famous hotspots here in Queensland and I've even seen them in the middle of the day, full sun, doing their thing, not fussed at all. But technically they are meant to be nocturnal, foraging throughout the night and they can eat up to 28% of their own body weight um, every night. So they, can, they need to forage but for at least 10 to 12 hours to be able to gain that. And they eat a variety of insect larvae. Uh, so your caddisfly larvae, drag, dragonfly larvae, um, fish eggs, worms, crustaceans, mollusks, and uh, possibly tadpoles if they can capture them as well. And certainly um, 
we have a lot of these little shrimp that's on the screen in uh, these waterways in Brisbane, which is really great. One of the most fascinating things about the platypus, I think, and it must be my favourite, is their bill. And so when they're feeding, they close their eyes, ears and nostrils and they use their rubbery bill to locate their prey. So you can see all those tiny little pores on the platypus's bill. They're the electroreceptors. And so when their food source is uh, giving off little uh, pulses, muscle pulses when they're moving, that's what the platypus can detect uh, when they're foraging through the debris and the rocks and things. That's what they're detecting, tiny little impulses. They forage through the bottom of the stream and they fill their cheek pouches. And that's when they come up to the surface and then they will grind their food on a horny, horny grinding pad. Um, they don't have teeth. So they will uh, bring out the food from their cheek pouches and kind of grind from side to side. If you've watched platypus in the water, it's kind of grinding side to side. Um, and then they'll dive again. It's about a 60 second cycle when they're uh, diving. And platypus are highly important for their ecosystem. They are a top order predator, preying down upon those uh, macroinvertebrate that I mentioned, their uh, insect larvae. And when they are foraging, they're increasing productivity within the actual water columns. So the micronutrients that settle on the bottom of a waterway, as they're foraging very vigorously through, those micronutrients are coming up into the water column for uh, to be able to feed those microorganisms that we can't see. So that's really important. For research, the female's milk has uh, component, components for potential antibiotics and the male's venom uh, can produce painkillers as well. But more recently, it has been known uh, there's a, a protein or uh, a component within the male's venom that can help with type 2 diabetes. So that can be synthetically now derived to, um, I guess, mass produce. We're not going to be going out and milking male platypuses anytime soon. But overall, as Matt said, the platypus is an iconic and a species. It's an umbrella species. So the fact that we can advocate and pr uh, promote conservation of platypus, we're protecting all those other animals that you see in that picture on the screen from the bugs, to the fish, to the turtles, through to the birds, bats and butterflies and things. So the species richness within, within a waterway, the platypus is definitely the guardian of the waterways. Conservation status of the platypus in 2016 was upgraded uh, on the International Union for Conservation of Nature red list too near threatened. And this was because there was starting to be records of localised declines. But overall, the lack of knowledge to predict population trends is also inhibiting and it makes it very unsure of the conservation status. In Queensland, it's unfortunately listed as least concerned. So it means it doesn't really get the focus that it potentially needs, especially with how much we're expanding our urbanisation uh, within Brisbane and close to those waterways where platypus inhabit. So we really don't know, but that's what we're trying to change. So the threats to platypus are certainly uh, urbanisation. We're increasing the impervious structures uh, that are really close to waterways. So we're concreting um, driveways and paths. And instead of when it rains, it normally would seep naturally into the system. It's going into the storm water and it's hard and fast flows. It's scouring out the in-stream channel, which displaces their food, therefore can displace platypus. Uh, but it also can really erode and change that in-stream um, morphology and possibly erode uh, key areas where platypus need to burrow and make those nesting sites. Again, we're removing the native vegetation, which will increase the erosion and obviously cause the issues for burrowing areas. And sedimentation in the water will not only disturb their food source by smothering their habitat, uh, it can reduce the level of the pool depths, uh, which platypus 
highly need uh, to forage and mate. If the water becomes too shallow, they risk predation. And if they do have to travel out over land, it becomes an issue um, trying to find other water sources as well. There's chemical runoff um, from the roads, from our gardens that will also impact their food source. And certainly other pollutions um, of material, plastic rings, fishing gears and rubber bands and hair ties. Be really mindful of uh, going about and finding rubber bands and hair ties uh, within your local neighbourhood when you're walking because they do get washed into our waterways. We've also changed uh, water use within our areas through dams and weirs, and we re reduced the natural environmental flows within some of these waterways. This again also impacts the level of water within waterways. Again, platypus are highly dependent on water, so that's a, a real concern. And climate change. Uh, as we increase uh, frequency of droughts, the refuge pools that they need to survive will decrease in water level. They will be then forced out to find uh, other water within the area. And unfortunately, in a mosaic landscape of urbanisation, they may not even be able to find water. Also, higher water temperatures will reduce their ability uh, to forage effectively because um, they do struggle in higher heat. And so that means they would possibly have to reduce their foraging time. So instead of 10 to 12 hours to be able to forage and get that 28% of their uh, body weight in food, if that's reduced, then they're going to be impacting their overall body condition, which is a concern. Predators for platypus, uh, we have the native birds of prey, uh, dingoes. There has been historic records of Murray cod harassing uh, platypuses uh, in the south, uh, pythons, goannas, uh, our rakali, and also crocodiles in the in the far north as well. But certainly, the introduced uh, species of foxes, cats, dogs are certainly an issue, and unfortunately, we are inadvertently impacting them as well. One huge concern uh, is the use of opera house nets or enclosed yabby traps. And they're used to capture yabbies, which obviously platypus love. So you're trapping not only their food source, it will attract them into these nets. And so they can come in, but they can't actually get out. It's not just platypus that these will attract as well. It's turtles, it's water rats, it's also um, some other water birds. And so they will drown. Um, there are alternative uh, nets, which are these uh, wildlife friendly ones that are open topped. And so, yes, they might be able to cheekily sneak a couple of yabbies out, but you'll still be able to get a great feed of yabbies regardless. And it's safe for all our aquatic wildlife. The band in now Victoria and ACT and Wildlife Queensland are lobbying the government to have the traps banned. There was a change in regulation back in 2015 um, so that the entrance holes within the freshwater waterways, if you were to use these nets, were at five centimetres, uh, a rigid opening. It had to be rigid and at five centimetres. And it's uh, the waterways east of the Great Dividing Range and the Gore Highway. There's a lot more information on our website if you'd like to um, have a look or uh, certainly contact us afterwards if you'd like some more information. And Platypus Watch Network was launched back in 2003. And this was an important community-based program to aim to collect information about observations of platypus, uh, not only within Southeast Queensland, but throughout the whole state. It was to develop a platypus database to then be able to identify where the conservation actions were needed for now and into the future. It's amazing because we can collaborate with not only catchment groups, but local councils uh, to run their own surveys um, and in, increase that monitoring and research within these catchments. Back in 2016, there was the Platy Count campaign, which rolled out observational surveys and a new method called environmental DNA. We looked back on the historical records on the Queensland WildNet database 
and we saw that there was a reduction of reported sightings. Uh, we, were we actually losing platypus or people just losing interest and not actually realising that they should be recording where they would see platypuses? Either way, we thought this was a massive concern and we wanted to know a lot more about platypus, especially in the highly urbanised area of uh, the Greater Brisbane region. So we wanted to understand that population distribution. Was it contracting or expanding? And compare that to the historical records over the last 20 years. We wanted to really establish a longitudinal survey to repeat uh, and consistently gain data over time, which is really important. And we wanted to trial the environmental DNA method, um, which is a definitely a reliable indicator to detect platypus occupancy within waterways and also implement that to be a, long tu a longitudinal uh, survey method. We engaged the community to not only help with observational surveys, but also um, for education and promoting platypus conservation within their little communities. So what is eDNA? It's the collection of genetic material which is obtained directly from environmental samples. So from soil, water or sediment. And lucky for us, the fact that the platypus forages and plays around in the waterway, their skin cells, hair cells and their faeces mix up and we can actually then detect uh, pick up those that DNA from the water. The lab that we work with down south develop species specific primers. So uh, as part of their DNA, what is specific to platypus and what identifies, um, you know, this piece of DNA to be platypus, that's what the primers are developed for. And then the genetic analysis enhances the amount of DNA that we collect to then um, specify the target DNA which is absolutely ideal for a cryptic species like the platypus. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Um, they can be very shy in some areas. And so this is a great method to be able to obtain that data. It's non-invasive, so we don't have to collect, um, actually have the animal um, in our hands as such. And it's very easy to facilitate ongoing data collection and it's, I'll talk about further our research. The method that we've been using is taking two samples, which is this filter that's on the screen. It's about uh, two, three centimetres long. And we're taking um, two of these samples at multiple locations along a waterway. Those waterways have been chosen from the historical data that we've looked at um, previously. And we wanted to determine if platypus was still in these waterways. We avoided contamination by wearing gloves, um, making sure we're not putting our, our feet in the water and things, because it is very sensitive. And we wanted to pass at least 500 mils of creek water through that, um, that filter. So it's a 0.22 micron filter paper, and it's equivalent of those life straws, which are the straws that you can suck up from a dirty puddle and is meant to actually extract out you know, all the other bacteria or anything like that. So it's high, it's very fine um, to be able to pick up those fragments of DNA that we need. We package it all up in a freezer box and we transport it straight to Melbourne for processing um, within at least 24 to 48 hours. So the lab gets back to us and it can tell us if the sample is positive which means that there is platypus within that waterway. It gives us a number or concentration of DNA, which can potentially give us an idea of activity or if there's maybe more platypus within the area, but it's certainly very hard to determine that specifically. It cannot tell us individual numbers, unfortunately, at the moment. That would be amazing if it did. Uh, it can't tell us if they're related, uh, the individuals, or the precise locations of the animals, obviously because they are, are swimming within a waterway. Um, you just don't know, the, the mixing and the flow of the water can certainly um, change the direction where the eDNA is coming from. Yes, it does degrade uh, the DNA, it still is a snapshot in time. 
And so UV temperature, um, the flow of the water can degrade the DNA. So definitely it is still a snapshot in time. And that's where repeated sampling within these waterways is really important. We can gain more confidence of where platypus are actually, um, you know, specifically uh, staying within a region or if they're no longer there anymore. So the last five years, Wildlife Queensland have been implementing environmental DNA within the waterways of Greater Brisbane. There's been over 185 sample locations, which equates to 66 waterways in the region. 25 of those individual waterways are positive for platypus DNA. But unfortunately, because we have been repeating some of these waterways, we have found a decline or a localised extinction within uh, the Brisbane region, closer to the Brisbane CBD around the Inogra catchments. So from the observational surveys and the eDNA, I have then, be a, I've then been able to develop my detailed population studies. So this is to further determine the impacts and threats on populations. So to actually start putting a number on decline, are populations isolated? And are there any areas of interest that we really need to focus on because they are highly impacted and possibly disconnected within the region. I'm capturing the platypuses and getting data of body condition, as well as uh, genetics as well from a little tissue sample. This is all done under strict animal ethics and permits um, to be conducted. And it's all above board as well. So animal welfare is the number one thing that I take very seriously. I'm using fike nets, which are pictured on the screen. So they have wings that span the width of the creek and then a windsock-like structure off to the back there where you can see me hammering the end of that windsock. It has two-way baffles, so platypus can swim in but can't get out. And so I'll be setting multiple uh, sites of these uh, throughout a waterway in an afternoon and then checking them throughout the night um, every couple of hours to see, fingers crossed, if there's any platypus, but certainly if there's any other turtles, um, fish or anything like that. So, um, and then that's just done over a nighttime period and then they're packed up and I will uh, repeat every uh, week or so. Once I do capture a platypus, I weigh them, I measure them. We can gain an idea of their body condition through uh, their tail fat index. So by folding their tail over on the sides, if it's quite rigid um, and it doesn't fold, there's a lot more fat within their tail. That means they're in really good body condition. I take some measurements of their bill. We obviously identify male or female by their spur but also this, as I mentioned earlier, the males, uh, we can identify a general age due to their spur class. And then I take a little tissue sample, which is just from their hind foot webbing um, for genetic analysis. So all this information from our observational data, eDNA and my population studies will filter into the national distribution data. And we need to report these findings, which will then help engage with stakeholders such as local councils, local NRM groups. And they are the ones that are on ground influencing future catchment rehabilitation programs. So it's really important to continue this monitoring with all methods because of their elusive behaviour. We need to make sure we're using everything available to us to be able to develop the information and research further into platypus populations. And overall, we're protecting an iconic um, species, but also our freshwater ecosystems, which is really important. Make sure you're sending through a lot of your questions, please. Um, we'll be coming up to the end and having a great Q&A session, I'm sure. But how can you help platypus in your own little areas, um, or even if you're not local to Australia, or even some areas where platypus are, 
just in general, our freshwater waterways, how you can help. Be mindful of your water consumption. Obviously, the time that you take to shower or the amount of water you use to wash your dishes um, and clean up rubbish within the area. Certainly, everything gets washed into waterways, uh, plastic bags, bottles and things all impact our wildlife. Cut circular rubbish rings, um, your hair ties, rubber bands, any of those bottle uh, rings on the bottles, which platypus can, uh, when they're foraging, if they're at the bottom of the, the creek, they can get them caught up and around uh, their arms, which will impact their foraging. And uh, we have had platypus in the past, unfortunately, be found um, dead because of, of this, uh, these rubber bands or hair ties. Rehabilitate the creek banks, which is really important for platypus burrow sites, like I mentioned. Join your local catchment group. They, they are the ones that are hands-on doing this work of uh, replanting areas and weeding. And it's really great fun. You get to be a part of the community to be able to, to improve the waterway habitat. If you do live on properties uh, where there's creeks running through, if you can, uh, if it's safe to do so, leave logs in the waterways. That's a habitat for their, their food source in which platypus forage around. And it's also protection for them in the stream. So when they are foraging, if, if they do spot a predator, they can hide under the water, um, under the log or something like that. They have been known to hold their breath for up to 14 minutes. Uh, they wedge themselves underneath logs and to wait out, I guess, when uh, the predator and hopefully will leave. Again, if you do live within uh, a property that has a creek system running through it, think about excluding livestock to protect the banks. Again, the compaction and erosion that it causes for not only burrow burrowing sites, but the erosion and sedimentation within that will uh, wash into the waterway is a concern. Get out there and uh, weed some of the, the not so great native uh, plants within the riparian zones as well, and replant uh, with natives that are better to consolidate those banks for burrowing sites. Fish responsibly, you don't leave the fishing line lying around that other wildlife can get tangled up in. And please use the wildlife friendly alternative yabby nets um, that are safe in our freshwater waterways and report any illegal fishing. Our local uh, Queensland Fish, Fish Watch, uh, that's their number on the screen, but look up locally if you are in a different region where platypus are, uh, look up locally where you need to report that too. And certainly control dogs around your waterways, especially dawn and dusk when platypus are coming out to feed um, over the night time and then going back uh, to their burrows uh, on dawn after having a night of feeding. For further information, please shoot us an email if there's something that we've, we've missed today or may not discuss in the Q&A, um, certainly, uh, email us with your questions or if you have platypus sightings let us know they're really important the more we know where they are the more we know about the species obviously we can do a lot more to protect them there's a lot of resources on our wildlife queensland platypus watch network page so please have a look at those and there's some other great resources platypus spot and the australian platypus conservancy has some wonderful information and just in case you are in an area where you can see platypus, dawn and dusk are the best times for us to see them. And you want to be quiet and still. Some places they certainly are quite shy and they do know when there's something different near this, their little creek. You want to look for a, a, a trail of bubbles and those plumes of bubbles. And then they kind of slim line uh, swim up to the surface and then they bottom dive down again. And this is a cycle every 60 seconds or so. Imposters are your Rakali, water dragons, um, cormorants can be really cheeky. Even I've been um, 
taken back by keelback snakes in the distance thinking what is that and seeing something moving across the waterway so it's uh you know you you think you can see them because you're you're really wanting to see them um and your mind plays tricks on you and i'd just like to acknowledge uh for the efforts of the environmental dna the local councils ipswich logan redland brisbane and morton bay They've been uh, wonderful to come on board and help us with our environmental DNA program for the last five years. And then to our wonderful members, supporters and volunteers of the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland. Without you, you know, it, it, it really is important to have um, the support and you backing us with the projects that we have available. And also the Brisbane Airport Community Fund uh, came on board with some financial funds to help with the eDNA this year, so thank you. And this handsome fella on the screen was a beautiful male that I caught last year in Opossum Creek uh, near Ipswich, just west of Brisbane. And he just slinked off into the night. Um, he was pretty amazing. It was minus two degrees. It was one of the coldest nights for me. Um, I'm a bit of a sook now that I live in Queensland. Um, and it was a really great uh, surprise to see him in the nets when we went to check for the, the last check, which is the, the morning check before we pack up. And he was there to greet us. So that was really wonderful. If you'd like to follow my research updates, I'm on Instagram at Platypus Protector. And uh, I love sharing my experience. I'm very privileged to be able to do what I do. So. Thank you everyone for listening in today and I'll send it back through to Matt. Thank you, Tam. Um, so much amazing information presented there. And um, yeah, just, just, and thank you for your hard work with, with platypus conservation. We've had a lot of questions come through and we'll get to answering those questions um, in a few minutes time, but I guess just some things to summarize, go for the tail here for, Never have to catch a platypus, go for the tail, um, avoid that venomous spur. Isn't it crazy to think that a, an egg laying mammal has a venomous spur? It's um, insane. We also like the 28% body weight, you know, so if, if a platypus has to, can eat between 30 and 20% of its body weight, for me, that's uh, between 10 and 22 kilograms of food in a single day. Um, so they're busy little critters and, and it just shows you how hard they're working, how hard they're metabolizing when they've got to keep replacing quite so, so much food and body weight, um, amazing little animals. Also, you mentioned the Opera House traps and the importance of reporting any sightings to Fish Watch and that 1800 number was on the slide you gave us. Um, for all of you listening, that is terribly important to report. If you come across an Opera House trap um, that is unlabeled, doesn't have a, um, a float on it, then it's, it's incorrectly being um, used. Um, and we need to report those Opera House nets to fish watch because they are um, just a disaster for all air breathing aquatic species, platypus fish, turtles, water dragons, uh, water rats, birds, just, just a, a disaster. Um, and consider your actions, you know, Tamil is right. Anything that we, any water we, uh, we see in our yards, any water we see in our street and anything that's sitting in the street all flows into the creeks and has an impact um, negative or positive on the freshwater ecosystem. And I just recall uh, yesterday, Tamir, you posted some, a little video of you walking along the street and you collected 13 or 12 of the thick red uh, rubber bands that had come out of somewhere and was lying in the gutter. Um, now those things float, they're light, and that would absolutely have ended up in a creek at some point after the next rainfall. And you showed the images of those rubber bands being uh, going over the top of a platypus neck and killing those animals. So, you know, we as a, as people really need to consider what goes, what our implications are of um, what goes into our creeks for, to bumble around that. Um, and again, if you come across any platypus sightings on your daily activities, whether it be a walk, whether it be a trip to the country, we want to know about it. We'd love you to tell us what you found, where you found it, what time you found it, any other anecdotal information you can provide. And we'd love to hear from you if you just shoot an email to platypus at wildlife.org.au, then Tamil, who manages that, uh, that uh, email address, will be able to answer your question or at least record that sighting somewhere 
and recording our sightings is extremely important for knowing where platypus uh, still reside and live. All right, enough of me bumbling uh, through that. It's time to look at some questions. We've got quite a few questions here to look at. First of all, uh, one comes from Jeff Simmons and it's around distribution and their ability, ability to travel over land. Um, he was amazed that platypus had been able to cross from one watershed to another. How does this happen? How can they travel across dry land and have they ever been able to move from, say, one tributary over a range, a mountain range, into an adjacent tributary? Yes, great question. They are definitely known to move across land, especially when it's not uh, inhibited by urbanisation. So they are very well known to travel uh, in Tasmania and they actually have those road signs that say, look out for wildlife. It's actually got a platypus in it on it, which is pretty amazing. So they definitely have that ability and will travel over land if they have to, to an adjacent waterway. Um, obviously they do run the risk of predation on the mainland if they have to be forced out and travel over land. In terms of their distance traveling and if they can get over, you know, terrain and things like that, uh, I don't know too much about um, if they can do that. They certainly run out of steam um, because they can um, overheat, I guess. So they're not really great or well adapted to be walking across land for long distances. And so over terrain or over big mountain ranges, possibly not, but certainly it, you see some of the footage coming out from Tasmania and they really are like, all-terrain platypus, ATPs or something. They just, they're vertical. They are rugged just going up and down some of these rock faces in waterfalls. It's pretty amazing to see. So they're very well adapted to be able to climb and crawl. But I think the further the, the distance, they're going to run out of puff um, in that space. And then obviously within, on the mainland, they risk predation, but also they risk getting lost if they are within an urban waterway. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a platypus end up at the Kabulcha train station because it made its way through the stormwater drains and ended up, I don't know, trying to catch a train to Hogwarts or something. So, um, so yeah, they can end up in some really strange places being in an urban area. So certainly, um, but yeah, in terms of distance, I'm not too sure, but there's certainly a rugged little critter. Yeah, that's really good. And I guess they need to be. Uh, I didn't mention that given we've got so many questions, not all of them will get answered during this live chat session, but we will answer all of those questions um, and post them on the Wildlife Queensland webpage um, under the website link, um, probably by tomorrow, depending on how quickly Tamil can answer these questions. So if your question doesn't get answered today, I apologise, but it will be answered in full and written down for, for you to get that. Um, Steve Homewood's asked a great question, or two really. Um, they're unrelated, but they're worth discussing. Firstly, uh, do toads threaten platypus here in South East Queensland or in Queensland? And then secondly, um, and it may have some far reaching implications for platypus populations here in Queensland, but why did the platypus become extinct in South Australia? Great question, Steve. The cane toad question I get uh, often um, because cane toads are poisonous right through their whole life stages from tadpoles through to the adults. And so the fact that if platypus can capture tadpoles, is that impacting um, obviously their health? Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been research specifically into that. I'd like to think they may not be capturing tadpoles enough for them to be impacted. And maybe it's similar to those uh, toad sausages that the quolls eat that make them sick. So maybe the platypus have learnt to avoid cane toad tadpoles or something. Um, they're just my theories. Unfortunately, like I said, uh, the research hasn't been done there, but certainly interesting to kind of mull over that for sure. And uh, within South Australia, I am not too sure specifically why they became extinct. I think certainly water utilisation um, or the lack of water in some areas on the mainland uh, caused them to be quite isolated and then slowly just declined. The Warrawong Sanctuary there has uh, a man-made billabongs, but it's fenced um, to keep the platypus in there. So 
they're technically not mainland wild platypus as such. They're still kind of in captivity. So, but back in the 50s, they took platypus from uh, the mainland of South Australia and, and put them into Kangaroo Island. And obviously the water sources, the food resources and everything were wonderful for them. And they've, they've gone, um, they've increased quite a lot with their population on Kangaroo Island. So there's, it's certainly to do with their, definitely water. If water is lacking, that's the main thing that's going to reduce platypus within a region. Sorry, Tim, fantastic. Um, look, some more questions. We'll jump straight in. Here's a good one from Liz Downs. Um, during the 10 day incubation period, does the female stay in the nest the whole time? Yes, I believe so. Um, she will try and get up as much fat store um, before she goes into laying those nests, uh, laying those eggs. So she will try and eat as much as possible to keep her sustained for that, that period of time. They are known to then pop out and do short little feeds um, even when the babies are born. And um, a lot more has come out about that um, from the Hillsville group. They do a lot with, um, they're successful in breeding platypuses as well. So um, their female will come and go um, to feed to build up her stores again and then to obviously produce milk to be able to feed her young. All right, a um, couple more questions. Probably one that's quite relevant to, to, to the part you spoke about with some localised extinctions. Um, Mike is asking, have there been any sightings in Inogra Reservoir, Inogra Creek or Fish Creek? No, not for quite some time. So the last um, record that we had was from the Great Platy Search. There was a mass um, observational survey that went out across Queensland uh, by Rick Natras, and that was 2001. And that was the last time that we had a concrete sighting of platypus within the Inogra catchment. In terms of the reservoir itself, I've spoken to the rangers there and they haven't been lucky enough to see a platypus in there for quite some time. So um, not that we know of. Um, I th think there was, we did get a video last year of one um, swimming along the bank there. So that might be the first of, for, for a very long time, I'm not too sure, but we were going to hopefully try and do some eDNA sampling within the, the reservoir. So that might be exciting to really confirm that. Yeah, it's a real issue that, you know, there's another question has been on, on reintroductions, you know, is there any um, plans for reintroduction of platypus into these areas where they become localised, locally extinct or not there? You know, is, is it even possible or feasible? That's a really great one. Obviously, we need to start thinking outside the box when it comes to conservation of species and genetic rescue is certainly one of those. So reintroducing uh, animals within different populations to not only boost the populations that we have, but also then possibly establish um, populations that were once there, but no longer are. There is a lot involved with that, a lot of really highly detailed assessment to obviously make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and a lot of management around those individuals. So um, it's certainly, I hope, doable in the future. It's something that I hope may come out of my, uh, my PhD research. And a few people are starting to be able to, to delve further into the, the translocation or reintroduction of, of platypus in the areas. In terms of feasibility, if we had to start a breeding program of platypus, that's quite expensive. Um, platypus alone, they're, they're food bill is phenomenal. It's in the thousands of dollars a year because sourcing worms and uh, mollusks and crustaceans and everything and a variety of their food source organically as well is quite expensive. So if it was uh, some form of breeding um, population and then releasing, it may not be feasible, but moving animals around within catchments that are fairly close together maybe there still needs to be a lot of uh, research into 
if that is if that is doable and sustainable for the animals as well. Yeah, the big question is why they're missing in the first place, isn't it? That's really important. You'd hate to throw a platypus back into a waterway that was in some way um, unhealthy or bad for them. Um, I guess we're running really close to time, but one last question, and I think it's pretty pertinent to try and spark an interest in maybe some, some of our other li listeners um, who, who might want to, you know, get involved in platypus conservation. But it's really about you, Tamil, and it comes from Nova in the USA. So hi, Nova, and good on you for listening. And I'm not sure what the time difference is, but it's really great that we've gone international here. Nova asks, um, what made you want to study the platypus? Yes, hello, over in the US. Thanks for joining us, that's amazing. Um, I have some lovely people from the US that drop me a line every now and again. So if they're listening, hello. Um, I volunteered down in Victoria on a three-day platypus survey in the Grampians National Park back in 2014. And we were lucky enough to capture a couple of platypuses in that um, the Mackenzie River. And I guess I just... I had a moment with the platypus and thought this was pretty amazing to be up close and personal. Um, I learned so much about platypus from uh, Josh Griffiths, the ecologist I was with. And I came back to Queensland thinking, yep, there's got to be something similar. And there wasn't. I contacted Platypus Watch Network because they were the ones that came up when I Googled platypus in Queensland. And that's when our alliance formed. It was really great to have Platypus Watch come on board to help me develop my honours project. And now, after my honours project, there was still a lot more questions that needed to be answered. So I was lucky enough to get on board and do a PhD to hopefully be able to do so. Um, I'm just fascinated every time I just see them in the wild and I'm very privileged that I can do the research that I do and be up close and personal with them. But I don't take that for granted. I, I think it's, it's pretty amazing that I can, I can do that. And I certainly want to try to promote a lot more of platypus conservation within Queensland as well, because we do seem to be lacking in, in that data that's going to save them for the future. They are a species that will disappear and we wouldn't even know. And for me, that's really scary. So I guess that drives my, um, my intention to, to really start raising their profile and raising their conservation within the state. Yeah, that's fantastic, Tamil. Thank you. It's, um, we are lucky we've got such a long north-south distribution of platypus in, and we're far more lucky than other states to have quite a lot of platypus and suitable habitat for the species. But, um, you know, in a blink of an eye, if we don't protect that habitat and protect this species, they can disappear. Um, thank you so much, Tamil, for, for talking to us today and presenting that information. Uh, thank you also to uh, Peter Arndt for his kind words this morning from the Archdiocese of Brisbane and for giving us the opportunity to present as part of their um, their webinar series. Also to Jess from the Catholic Archdiocese of Brisbane for putting this whole uh, webinar together. We couldn't have done it without her help. Um, if you'd like to get involved in Platypus Watch, please drop us an email at platypus at wildlife.org.au um, or go to the webinar page on our website. You can see the link there, hopefully up now. Um, if not, it is under the events section on the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland website. Um, there'll be information there, this presentation and the answer to all of your questions that we didn't speak of today, we will certainly answer them in text and you will, if your question wasn't answered, we will endeavour to do so. So again, thank you so much everybody for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed it um, and in, please stay safe.